So for the ground, ground rules, if you have questions, please submit them via the question and answer. The questions are going to be moderated. Some will be answered directly uh, in, the, in the question and answer box, and some will answer live afterwards. But feel free to submit your questions about any aspect focused on applying to EpicNet and the EpicNet mission. OK, we can go ahead to the first talk by Dr. Baker. Hello, I'm Rebecca Baker, director of the NIH HEAL, or Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, and I'm very pleased to be speaking with you today. So just to give you a sense of what we're up against, the national crisis of opioid misuse, addiction, and overdose is affecting communities across our country. There has been a dramatic increase in overdose deaths over the past decade, 15 years. And despite our really significant policy and research efforts and uh, a modest period of leveling in 2019 and 2018, we're seeing, unfortunately, a continued rise in opioid overdose deaths across the country. This map shows you the states in which it's the most severe. So it's really a national crisis. And unfortunately, it has been profoundly affected by the COVID pandemic colliding with the opioid crisis in really deadly ways. So during the COVID times, we have seen an increase in drug use rates. We have seen an increase in drug overdose rates. And we've also seen challenges to treatment and recovery. Places where people would normally go seeking support are no longer available. And so we've unfortunately also seen an increase or preliminary increases in overdose deaths. Um, this is a national public health emergency that was declared in 2017 and something that we at the NIH have said this needs to be an all hands on deck effort addressing this crisis through biomedical research. But recognizing that durable solutions are not going to only take into account the need to address drug overdoses and drug addiction, but also the 50 million American adults who are affected by pain. Um, about half of them experience pain on a daily basis and about 20 million such high impact pain that they can't go about their normal healthy life, job responsibilities, family responsibilities, and other things that are meaningful to them. So here is what the NIH has come up with as a response to these two um, terrible crises. Um, it's the HEAL initiative or helping to end addiction long-term. It is over $500 million a year in research efforts um, spanning all the way from prevention, um, basic science, coming up with new targets for therapeutic intervention for pain and addiction, a large number of clinical trials testing what treatments work best for specific pain conditions, specific um, modalities and ways of treating addiction, and then a significant investment in implementation science, taking what we know works and bringing it to the people who are seeking help in specific settings. So together, we have over 25 different research programs represented in the initiative. I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these. Um, a number of different NIH institutes and center leading centers leading these efforts, and a, a real sense of partnership. We can't do this alone as researchers. We need to partner with our colleagues in the private sector, our um, fellow federal agencies, and communities across the country in order to, to really bring about scientific solutions to the opioid crisis. So here is how the overall HEAL initiative is organized. We have two overarching goals, first, enhancing pain management, and second, improving treatments for opioid misuse and addiction. 
Um, on the enhancing pain management side, we have preclinical and translational research. That's really increasing the number of shots on goal and speeding the pipeline to bring about new, effective, and safe non-opioid therapeutics for pain. But then in the clinical research realm, we're also testing what works and for who for specific pain conditions, because not all pain is the same, what are the most effective interventions? Then on the improving treatments for opioid misuse and addiction side, we have a number of complementary areas of research focus. So novel medication options, bringing there are three FDA approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder, coming up with new, more user-friendly um, formulations of those and also additional treatments to make um, it easier to stay in recovery. Enhance outcomes for affected newborns. Unfortunately, many babies are born exposed to opioids in utero, and then they go into withdrawal in the NICU. And so understanding the best ways to assess, treat, and track those babies long-term to see what the effects of those exposures are and how they can be effectively treated. Then um, in the new prevention and treatment strategies, this is where we're looking to really enhance the, the holistic way that we prevent and treat opioid, um, opioid use disorder. So looking at populations that are at high risk, people who might not have developed opioid use disorder just yet, people who are homeless, people who are young adults transitioning to adulthood, how can we tailor our interventions so that they're less likely to develop addiction and less likely to need treatment. And then lastly, translating research into practice. And that's taking the evidence-based interventions that we already have and we know to work and bringing them into specific settings like healthcare settings, emergency departments, um, working in partnership with schools and faith-based organizations to really bring effective treatments for opioid use disorder to people where they come seeking help. So this represents the sum of all of the different research projects we have within the HEAL initiative. I'll now focus a little bit on the pain management side and the work we have underway there. So next slide, please. Um, so you'll hear a lot more today about EpicNet or the early phase preclinical investigation network. Um, we have a number of grants already awarded in this um, program and then one trial underway for pain associated with knee osteoarthritis. In the Back Pain Consortium, we have um, 14 different research projects, a combination of mechanistic research, technology-oriented research, and phase two trials, all seeking to develop a um, precision medicine for back pain approach. In the hemodialysis opioid prescription effort, or HOPE, we have eight studies underway, all working to understand the best way to treat pain and opioid dependence in people who undergo hemodialysis for end-stage renal disease. Um, and the Effectiveness Research Network, um, or ERN, and in the PRISM program, or Pragmatic and Implementation Studies for Management of Pain to Reduce Opioid Prescribing, NIH is leveraging existing infrastructure, clinical research networks that we already had before the opioid crisis got as severe as it is now, and looking to test specific interventions for a variety of different pain conditions, knowing that the best treatment is going to depend on the individual and depend on the pain condition and depend on the treatment setting. So for the effectiveness research network, where we're comparing different evidence-based treatments for pain for specific pain conditions, we're studying knee osteoarthritis, post-surgical pain, post-mastectomy pain, um, chronic pain in cancer survivors, and then pain in veterans who also have opioid use disorder. And we're doing this in collaboration with a number of NIH institutes and centers. And then in PRISM, we're working to really implement and test the integration of non-pharmacological pain management strategies 
for fibromyalgia pain, post-surgery pain, sickle cell pain, and chronic low back pain. So as you can see, a number of different specific studies seeking to provide the evidence that clinicians need to give their patients the best and most likely to be effective treatment for their pain condition. We have um, been fortunate to, even though we launched in 2019, um, see some preliminary um, successes through our research um, in spite of the COVID and COVID related delays. So this includes the collection of a set of common data elements for heel pain clinical studies, um, a really um, innovative iterative model that takes into consideration multiple contributions to chronic low back pain such as anxiety, tissue damage, and then multiple potential interventions, psychotherapy all the way to surgery to develop the, a model that can predict what's going to be most effective for a person with chronic low back pain and inform a precision medicine approach to treating them. And then lastly, um, a new investigational um, approach to using buprenorphine for treating pain among people who um, undergo hemodialysis for and stage renal disease. So signs of progress and um, innovation in spite of obvious COVID related um, challenges to these studies. Um, we do have um, across all of our different research programs, certain themes that have popped up um, because we are fighting an urgent public health crisis, it's extremely important that we make the products of our research, um, our data and our research findings immediately available to our community. And that includes other researchers, but also clinicians and uh, members of the public. So a sharing and um, open access policy for data created through the initiative because it's so important that the products of our research are meaningful to um, the patients and populations we serve, a focus on engagement of research participants and um, sustaining that connection with um, patients and participants from the beginning and all the way to the design phase to the end and the dissemination phase of research. And then lastly, the importance of partnerships, diversity, and inclusion. We are not going to be able to provide scientific solutions to the opioid crisis if we focus on just one or two populations. We really need to um, think about all of the different people in our community and the best ways to provide scientific solutions to all of them. So I'll tell you just a little bit now about the field data ecosystem. Here on the left, you can see all the different types of data that are being collected. It's quite diverse, as you might imagine, for such a broad and diverse research initiative. Our goal through the HEAL data ecosystem is to enable access and make our data findable, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and to do this in a way that allows researchers to come up with their own discoveries, and to be able to layer on new tools and new um, scientific approaches to our research products such that people can come up with their own novel and um, creative ways to shed light and provide insight into pain and opioid use disorder on top of the research that our investigators are already carrying out. Um, and to make it available more broadly, so not just to investigators, but also to policymakers, patients, um, clinicians, and to enable um, the translation of our research projects and findings into practice. Here I'll show just a, a little bit of um, what we call use cases, ways that individuals can engage with field data. They're very general, but you can see that we seek to um, enable research findings to be of use to community-based service organizations, clinicians treating patients, um, research experts in multiple different fields, and especially in the trans translational space, and this is a value for EpicNet, to validate drug targets, to um, come forward with the most promising and most innovative approaches for treating pain. So I'll stop there. And um, next you'll hear more specifically about EpicNet and what the um, program has available for researchers. Thank you all for coming to this webinar. I'm Barbara Karp, 
I'm a neurologist and I am the program director for EpicNet. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the, Ep the EpicNet application and review process and with a focus on the purpose and function. The stated goal of EpicNet is to reduce reliance on opioids by accelerating early phase clinical trials of non-addictive pain therapeutic assets, including drugs, small molecules, biologics, and devices. We are clearly in the phase two space, so we need assets that are phase two ready, either with an existing IND IDE or IND IDE ready. Assets can be novel or repurposed. We do not have a focus on any particular pain condition for the network overall, but each application should focus on a specific pain population or condition with high unmet need. And we leave that up to the applicant who can really select the population or condition that's a best fit for their asset. Our clinical trials incorporate proof of concept testing and validation of biomarkers, incorporation of deep phenotyping and innovative trial design. We can include studies on either adults or pediatric pain. And we're also involved, uh, we're also intended to study how you study pain. So we will learn from our experience to adapt uh, and our early phase testing for new pain therapies. Here is our infrastructure. We at NIH uh, with HEAL and NINDS interact with all EpicNet components. We provide oversight and guidance on the budget and milestones. The asset provider provides the pain therapeutic, which needs to be clinical grade and clinical trial ready for the study. And importantly, they retain the intellectual property rights to the asset. We have a clinical coordinating center, which is at Mass General. They develop the protocol in collaboration with the asset provider. They match the hubs and spokes to the protocol asset to get the population that's needed and the expertise needed to run the clinical trial. They oversee trial budget and manage uh, trial conduct and manage the budget. We have a data coordinating center at NYU that provides all data services, including statistical input and analysis, a data repository. They harmonize the data and provide data for regulatory reporting. They also manage a biorepository for EpicNet and all of HEAL. We have 12 clinical hubs across the United States, and they have associated spokes that allow us broad outreach into the, the communities across the United States with a lot of diversity of uh, race and ethnicity and underserved populations, as well as diverse ac access to pain populations. That's the sites where the trials are actually conducted, and they gather the data and report it on to the DCC and CCC. We have a three-stage application process, preliminary application, dossier application, and protocol application. For the preliminary application, there's completion of just a preliminary fillable PDF that undergoes independent objective review and internal NINDS administrative review. Applications that are selected to move forward to stage two then are assigned to work with an NINDS contractor to prepare the dossier, which is a deep dive into the asset pharmacology or uh, specifications for devices. And then the applicant submits the dossier in ERA Commons. It again goes back for independent objective review and NINDS internal administrative review. Those that are selected to move forward to stage three then work with the clinical coordinating center to develop the protocol and its budget. That application gets submitted by the clinical coordinating center on behalf of the applicant in ERA Commons. The protocol goes forward for a third objective independent review and NINDS administrative review. Those protocols that are selected to move forward then go for NINDS council review and then forward to HEAL Executive Committee that makes the final funding decision. You can see that we have a pretty aggressive timeline. We're aiming for six to nine months from submission of the preliminary application to sign off on the other transaction agreement, which is the funding agreement, so that trial setup can begin. To hone in a little bit more for the preliminary application, 
you can find it on our website and the HEAL website. And it's a pack includes the, an overview of EpicNet and the application process, the fillable PDF preliminary application form itself, line-by-line -line instructions for the preliminary applications, and the instructions for submitting an ERA Commons. We strongly encourage you to talk to us before submitting a preliminary application. We can help troubleshoot some of the more common problems that uh, lead to an uh, application not moving forward and give you some input on how to make your application as strong as possible. The preliminary application is only asking for high level information about the asset. What is it? what preclinical and clinical studies support it. We just asked for the citations, identification of any known safety concerns, the proposed indication you want to study, the dose exposure and route of administration, and very importantly, what makes your asset unique and especially better than others in a class or better than other things available for the same indication. And then it includes a freedom to operate letter from the asset owner. I've identified some common reasons for preliminary applications not moving forward, and a lot are because people submit too soon. The asset is simply not phase two ready. There's inadequate data to support uh, safety or efficacy or use in the particular indication being described. Some applications have assets that really don't demonstrate any clear advantage over available therapeutics in the same class or they don't provide enough data to show a strong scientific basis. Some have safety concerns that lead to them not moving forward. Those that do move forward to the dossier, the contractor prepares a 15 to 20 page dossier with the sections that are listed on the left side of the slide. And you can see there's a lot, of, lot more in-depth information requested about the asset. The applicant role in dossier development is really to provide the contractor with as much detailed information as possible to make the dossier as strong as possible. We ask that FDA type information be provided, that the information you would give the FDA to support an IND or IDE filing and an investigator brochure. If there were concerns raised during review of the preliminary application, make sure you address those in preparing the dossier. The contractor protects confidentiality and they have three working weeks to prepare the dossier for you. The applicant submits the dossier then in ERA Commons and that triggers the next review cycle. For the protocol application, those that move forward then work with the clinical coordinating center and the data coordinating center to prepare the trial protocol and budget. We choose from within the network a protocol principal investigator who has the expertise needed for a clinical trial with that asset and in that pain condition. The study population is finalized, the, style, the trial design is uh, finalized, and that may incorporate placebo and active controls and may incorporate biomarkers. This is where we define the applicant's role in the trial. Some applicants want to be very involved and others do not. And the actual role itself will be negotiated in a collaboration between EpicNet and the applicant. And that's where we also develop the budget and timeline. The funding for EpicNet is different from contracts, grants, and cooperative agreements. We are using a funding mechanism called Other Transactions. Other transactions give us a lot of flexibility to move funds around as needed within the context of our clinical trials. It's important to know that the asset owner, the applicant, doesn't get the funds. The OT fund goes to the clinical coordinating center and they they distribute and manage the funds for the trial conduct. So the asset holder gets access to EpicNet for development and completion of a clinical trial, but not funds. And data from the clinical trial can be used to support further therapeutic development, later phase trials, regulatory filings, things like that. And the asset holder is expected to provide clinical grade therapeutic asset for the trial while retaining IP rights. We're open to both US and non-US applications. I wanted to show the first trial that is coming through EpicNet. 
which is a 24 week study of the efficacy and safety of CNTX 6970 in moderate to severe knee osteoarthritis pain. And the study design here is randomized allocation concealed multicenter placebo controlled crossover. We have two randomized uh, assessments. The first is allocation to treatment and then randomization to an order. And in this trial, we were able to, with only 150 patients, have three arms, two with dose, different doses of the study drug compared to placebo, and a third drug with an, with an active control of celecoxib. And one of the things I would point out is the study drug is not being compared to celecoxib. The celecoxib arm is solely to establish network sensitivity to a known active asset. This is our contact information. We have an epicnet at nindes.nih.gov mailbox that will reach us all, or you can contact the individual members of our epicnet team. And I'd like to acknowledge everybody here, Rebecca Hammer, Jennifer Byerline, and Marlene Peters-Lawrence. So thank you all, and we look forward to hearing from you and hopefully uh, seeing some applications. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EpicNet webinar. I am Anna Olario, Scientific Review Officer at the NINDS, leading the EpicNet reviews with my colleague, Dr. Shanta Rajaram. Our presentation today is an overview of the EpicNet review process. The main message that we want to bring across today is that the EpicNet reviews are not standard NIHP reviews. These reviews are independent objective reviews, which differ than peer reviews in terms of type of applications, review discussions, and review outcome. In this slide, we have a high level overview of the review process itself. The review process consists of three stages. A stage one, asset applicant or asset owner submits preliminary application which consists of a brief asset data. There are no funds associated with this stage. At stage two, high rated preliminary application from the prior review and the asset owner are invited to work with the NINDS contractor and submit the dossier application, which contains in-depth data about the asset. There are no funds associated with this stage. A stage three, highly rated dossier application for the from the prior review and the asset owner are invited to work with the clinical coordinating center and submit the clinical trial protocol. The clinical trial protocol, highly rated from the prior review, are eligible for funding. However, the asset owner does not receive the funds. Asset owner has access to the intent EPICnet to conduct the clinical trial. The funds will be distributed to the clinical coordinator and center and further distributed within the centers of the EPICnet. At each of these stages, we convene an independent objective review panel, which evaluates the assets proposed in the preliminary applications the dossiers, and the clinical protocol. These reviews are followed by another level of reviews conducted by the NINDS staff, NINDS Advisory Council, input from Hill Multidisciplinary Working Group, and the NIH Hill Executive Committee. In these slides, we have an overview of the application submission and the main steps where the review takes place preliminary applications submitted by the asset owner undergo the first objecting review at stage one. Highly rated preliminary applications from these reviews and the asset owner are invited to work with the NINDS contractor and submit the dossier application. This submission is by invitation only. The dossier applications undergo the second objected review at stage two. Highly rated dossier applications from this review 
and the asset owner are invited to work with the clinical coordinating center to develop the clinical protocol and submit the protocol application. This submission is by invitation only. Protocol applications undergo the third objective review as stage three. Highly rated preliminary application from this review will undergo further review conducted by the NINDS program staff, advisory council, and Hill review. In the next slides, we are going to bring details of the objective review itself. The goals of the independent objective reviews are to have a fast, fair, streamlined review process. Also, to get input from the outside experts for NINDS Hill consideration of EPICNET awards. Consensus is not, however, the goal of these reviews, but rather to obtain reviewers' individual opinions on each of the proposed therapeutic. We'll manage conflicts of interest by using principles that the NIH review conflict of interest policy as a guide. There is a core panel of reviewers consisting of about 20 to 30 members. The same panel reviews EPICnet applications at each of the stage of the review, although not all members are present at every meeting. We invite experts, ad hoc reviewers, with special expertise at each of the stages of the review as needed to cover science, rigor, and methodology. In regard to the application submission, the preliminary application in stage one are submitted on a rolling basis. The dossier application, stage two, and clinical protocol application, stage three, may be submitted by invitation only and are submitted in ERA commons under different, different uh, research opportunity announcement numbers. The EPICnet reviews are conducted on a rolling basis, determined by the number and timing of application submissions. At each of these stages of the review, stage one, two, and three, there are different review criteria matched to the specific stage of the review. For example, a stage one preliminary application, the review is focused on a high level evaluation Specifically, the focus is on the asset suitability for EPICnet with consideration of target population. There is less emphasis on the proposed trial design at this stage. A stage two, the dossier application, the review is focused on the asset pharmacology um, of the drug or biologic or um, device specification if the asset is a device. In addition to preclinical and clinical data in support of the asset for the proposed population, there is also consideration of proposed clinical trial design. A stage three protocol application, there is a thorough review of all aspects of the clinical trial. Review also includes consideration of criteria such as protection of human subjects, safety monitoring, and inclusion plans, for example, gender, minorities, and an individual across the lifespan. In regard to the outcome of the review, permitting individual reviewers' assessments are entered online in ERA Commons. Reviewers identify key strengths and weaknesses and provide a recommendation for a color bean, reflecting their level of enthusiasm for the application to move forward or not. For example, for the green bean, the applications included are meritorious. For the yellow bean, are included those applications which are deemed meritorious but some concerns are noted by the reviewers. In the red bean, the applications are not deemed meritorious as serious concerns are noted by the reviewers. 
the application may not be discussed. In the last slide, post-independent objective review, the NINDS convenes an internal administrative review committee consisting of NINDS program officers knowledgeable about pain in clinical trials. The NINDS EpicNet staff will notify the applicants of selection decision and decision driving concerns. Important to note is that review summary statements are not provided to the applicants. The final decision for funding a clinical protocol application, a stage three, lies with the NINDS director, with NINDS council consideration and health leadership. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Lori Raman. I'm with ERA at NIH. I'm gonna briefly give you a tour through the process of preparing, submitting, and tracking your OTA applications using ASSIST. So first I wanna tell you that OTA programs do not require submission through grants.gov. We've done our very best to, uh, to reduce the burden on applicants by streamlining or limiting the number of registrations that they have to process. We do require one, and that's that all submitting organizations must be registered at ERA Commons. We've tried to make that simpler too, so you will not need a DUNS to register, at least for the submission part of the process. We require that the organization has an individual with the role of signing official. This person has signing authority for the organization. And there must be an additional person with the role of PDPI, and they must have their Commons ID affiliated with the submitting organization. We've had a, uh, we've had a case or two where one person does both, in which case that's fine, but you're gonna need two Commons accounts. So let me tell you a little bit about ASSIST. So uh, ASSIST, which stands for Application Submission System and Interface for Submission Tracking or Status Tracking, is NIH's system to system solution. It's a one-stop shop where you can prepare, submit, and track your application without leaving ASSIST. Uh, we've also made the application process simple by only requiring a single form and a number of attachments. And that number can be up to 100. And again, you're gonna be following the instructions provided by the EpicNet team. Most importantly uh, on this slide is that you must use the opportunity provided by EpicNet in this format. So OTA-21-005, that's your ROA or, or your other funding opportunity announcement. The neat thing is if the PI completes their profile when they register at ERA Commons or affiliated in ERA Commons, they can use the information associated with their Commons ID to pre-populate a number of the fields on the application. So this is just a quick screenshot uh, of ASSIST. And so the left-hand panel um, here is where you're gonna put that opportunity announcement in, OTA-21-005, no quotes, you're gonna hit go. When you hit go, you're gonna be taken over to this screen, which is the initiation screen. It provides some basic information about the ROA. The one thing that you're gonna to have to do is add a title. You can edit it later if you don't like the title that you enter here, but that's a mandatory field. Here's where, uh, as I mentioned before, if you enter your Commons ID or the PI's Commons ID, populate, we will uh, use that information in Commons to go ahead and populate a lot of the information for the organization as well as the PDPI. The last button here in red is initiate application. So all of a sudden you are taken to the application and this is really what it looks like. So those of you that are used to submitting grant applications to grants uh, to NIH knows that there's usually an array of forms. Well, we've just gotten it down to one. So let me just give you a, a quick walk through what we're seeing here. On the left-hand side with the, um, the arrow here are the navigation bars. So the first one, manage access, allows individuals with manager roles to grant, grant access to individuals to help out with the application. Not required, but a nice tool um, if you need it. 
Um, mandatory forms are always are going to be displayed across the tabs here, but for some instances, we have some optional forms that are required for some programs and not others. That's why they're optional. And that's where you would find them in the add additional form. Preview application, this is a real nifty tool. This allows you to view the application as an assembled image, much like the reviewers will. And we're going to see that a little bit more on that later. Validate applications. This allows you to pre-run the business rules that we use to check the application while you're putting it together. It's a nice little tool to find things that you might have missed or figure out what more you have to complete. View application, uh, sorry, view status history, not so important for OTAs, but really useful for complex application. And then important for today's discussion is update submission status. So once you've initiated an application, we're going to give you a unique identifier, in this case, 21115. And what we anticipate is you may not want to do this all at once. And so we want to give you an opportunity to go back, forget all that initiation part, just go directly to find this application again uh, when you want to resume working on it. And this is the number that you're going to type in to, to use to find the application. Um, and then here is sort of the status bar. In this case, we're um, uh, this one has been converted to ready for submission um, and then submit. But when you're work in progress, you're going to see that it's basically a work, work in progress. And this tells you when you last basically updated the status of the application. So I'm just going to do a very, very quick walkthrough through a couple of the forms. Um, so most of the information that we have on the sort of what we call uh, structured data elements are things that we care about, um, which are the addresses of the or organization, the uh, AOR or the ASO, the signing official, the person with signing authority for the organization, and a bit of information about the PDPI. Um, we have a whole tab for the PDPI to um, open up and give us a little bit more information about themselves, as well as providing a, a bio sketch. And all this is just sort of straightforward um, enter, entering the data. Um, you may not be able to see it, your resolution, but um, I can see, and I'll highlight here, we have little red stars or asterisks. These are required field. Now, the most important part of the applications um, are these, the attachments. And these are all the things that are going to be uh, required for you to put in the application based on the information in the EPICNIC program. Um, and this also reminds me to tell you a little bit about um, these buttons down here, because there are some folks, they're not uh, intuitively obvious. Um, so buttons are, are save and keep locked. And this prevents someone from uh, editing a form that you're working on, if you're the PDPI or, or whoever's working on it. And this is just sort of, um, it's like a, an ice cream scoop. It scoops the form into your, in your swim lane and lets you work on it and prevents anyone from sort of overriding any of the things that you've done. Save and release, again, saves the information, but then releases it so that someone else could work on it if, if you needed to. Again, not so important for uh, the OTAs because they are so simple. Really big helps when you have complex applications with multiple components. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have this important person with the role of signing authority for the organization uh, known as the signing official. They are the only ones who can submit an application on behalf of the foreign organization. So um, they're gonna have to log in using their credentials. Uh, you're gonna provide them with that unique identifier 21155, 2115. Uh, and then what I suggest doing before you change the submission status, and I'll go through that uh, in a second, is to run the validations. This is a great tool, as I mentioned earlier, to find any fields that are required that you haven't uh, completed. Uh, so hopefully you, you pass all of those validations, or if you fail, you go in and you correct them. Uh, and then you're going to then hit, as this red button indicates, the update submission status. Um, you're going to hit the submit button. Now the U is the SO. They're going to be given a pop-up screen uh, saying, do you really want to submit this application? They're going to say yes. And then the application um, will, again, go through the business rules, check, and then be submitted directly to NIH. If you do encounter any errors, they must be corrected. We cannot assemble an application unless all of the errors have been addressed. 
So then um, it's, as I mentioned, this is a single system. So after you've submitted the application and here we see a submit, you can click on this button, view submission status, and it's gonna take you to this status page. And you can click on this a couple times, usually only takes a minute or two to process at the most. And then when you know that you're successful, when you see this number, it's called an accession number or an agency tracking number. The cool thing then is if you click on this number, it takes you to our ERA Commons and the grant folder where you can view the assembled grant image. So one stop shopping. So here's a, a quick uh, snapshot of what the uh, application will look like. This is the cover page. Uh, we're gonna take all of those form fields, make it this nifty PDF. We're gonna attach all of the uh, documents that you've put in as PDFs. Again, important, we only accept PDFs. We're gonna bookmark the application, create a table of content, um, and we're gonna send a communication to you, the, uh, the PDEPI the, and the SO saying, we've got your application. Um, and then to, to, to again, uh, suggest that you keep tracking the status of the application through its entire life cycle um, through ERA Commons. So that's it. it it's pretty safe, uh, straightforward and simple. We have a fabulous service desk that you can call if you have any questions. And we'll um, take a break now and open this up for questions. Thank you all. At this time, we'd like to open up um, for Q&A and live responses. Um, Barbara, I'll let you introduce the panelists and then we can have some of the questions read. Okay, so the questions will be handled by the review officers, by uh, Laurie from ERA Commons and from EpicNet staff, uh, myself and Marlene uh, Peter Lawrence. Um, so we have uh, the, uh, some questions that have been submitted queued up. And uh, actually, I think uh, Adisa is going to uh, pose the questions and then we'll answer them. Absolutely. Um, so the first question was, does IND ready mean the IND is already submitted or that the state of development is ready for the IND submission? Okay, so the answer to that is the latter. We can accept applications where the IND is not in place or where there's an existing IND that has not yet been modified to accommodate a, a new study or a new indication. Uh, if something does not have an existing IND, by IND readiness, we mean that you have all the data that the, the FDA would require in support of an IND application. So it's really ready to go for the IND. We have also had some questions regarding whether or not the applicant needs to be the IND holder. And we have some flexibility there. If, it, if an application gets forward to clinical trial, we may have the opportunity to have the clinical coordinating center or the principal investigator who's selected for the study be the IND holder. Great. Um, so the second question was, what is the process to register for non-affiliated organizations if a staff is assigned for an individual applicant to register and submit the application? Do you need notarized letter of authorization? So Lori, do you wanna take that? I, I'm sorry, I, I missed the question. My, my computer um, refreshed itself. No problem. Um, so the question was, what is the process to register for non-affiliated organizations if a staff is assigned for individual applicant to register and submit the application? Do you need notarized letter of authorization? Uh, no, you do not. So um, 
you can there's a, a couple of different approaches and these are outlined in the uh, instructions that we provided uh, to the epic net which is available to you you have a couple of different options at that point you can uh, register as an individual there's a pathway to do that um, and then you can also be affiliated with another organization so there's a couple of different options and they are outlined um, in the instructions Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, and for the following question, um, so if my asset might be good for more than one indication, how do I show that in the application? Okay, so we have had a number of uh, applicants talk to us when they have an asset that they think may be good for various either acute or chronic pain conditions, uh, can they suggest more than one indication within the application? We ask the applicant who really knows their asset best to choose which pain condition really is the best fit for their asset. But we acknowledge that there that may not always be clear. Um, so it can be indicated in the discussion or text session sections of the application that you're focusing on this for the purpose of application, but the, the compound or the asset or device may have broader applicability. Uh, but we ask you to choose one to focus on for the application since you know your asset best. That being said, during the review process, if it moves forward to dossier and then to protocol, Within the network, we may ask you to refocus during the process of review, the reviewers may have an opinion that a different indication might be a better fit. And then we would have a discussion with you about refocusing on a different condition. Great. Um, and the next question is asking if EpicNet is open to CBD or new opiates drugs. So, so we can consider drugs that really have been uh, our controlled substances. If you come to us with an opiate or something uh, similar, we will look very carefully at the data, the preclinical data and any available clinical data on addiction and abuse potential. We are not looking for another opiate which will get us into similar problems with addiction and, and misuse. Uh, so we can consider drugs in those classes, but we are going to look very carefully to make sure that we are not compounding the problem rather than addressing it. Great. And the next question um, asks, what help can you give if my asset is not, a, is not phase two ready? So EpicNet is not able to accommodate uh, preclinical testing or uh, preparation of the drug. We've also been asked whether or not we could help pay for preparing the drug, uh, pharmaceutical grade drug. We are, we are not able to do that, but we can help point you to other resources at NIH, other programs and funding opportunities that may help you be able to prepare an asset for a phase two clinical trial. Great. Uh, we also have a question for Lori. Um, it does state, I have seen requirement for Don, SAM number, and logging.gov requirements to turn individuals to organization. For registering uh, at OTA, we've again streamlined this process. So when you go into Commons, you'll be given three choices. You'll be asked if you want to register for NIH, if you want to register for one of our partner agencies, or whether you want to register for OTA. Select that you wish to register for OTA, and you do not require you do not require a DUNS number for that registration process. Since you are not going to be using grants.gov, you don't need uh, grants.gov registration, uh, SAM registration, cage numbers, or any of those other um, any of those other registrations. So you just need the done. Uh, sorry, you just need to register at ERA Commons. Okay, thank you for that specification. 
The next question also asks, would it help if I target a condition with a large population like peripheral neuropathy rather than a rare condition? Okay, we, um, we are not focused on, con our, on either large or small populations. Rare diseases and rare conditions are equally accepted to us as those that affect large segments of the population. Great, and thank you for answering. Um, there's also a question about the review process. And the question does ask, what feedback will I get from review? Can I address review concerns and reapply? So Anna, Anna Shanta, do you want to take the review question? Hi, Barbara, this is Anna. Um, the uh, feedback that the applicant receives is not in the form of the uh, typical uh, uh, critiques, but uh, rather it's going to be a response as a notification letter from the, from the program staff. And, and regarding uh, resubmission, uh, we do not want a response back to the review, but if you feel you are able to address the issues raised during the review, you can submit a new preliminary application and incorporate the additional information. Thank you so much. The next question asks, our medical devices respond to this RFA as well? like non-invasive neuromodulation devices? Uh, yes, we, we are completely open to devices. And if you look at the preliminary application, there are sections that specifically address information we would need to review a, a, a device. Thank you for that answer. Um, also, um, we do have a question about foreign entities. Can they apply as well, or can you apply as a foreign entity? Uh, yes, EpicNet is open to uh, international applications from outside the US. And uh, that is partly because keep in mind the funding, if it is awarded at the final stage of review, goes with stays within EpicNet. It's awarded to the clinical coordinating center to run the trial. So a foreign entity would not receive money, just like a US entity would not receive money, but uh, they would get uh, access to EpicNet for a phase two trial. Excellent. And for our last question, um, does EpicNet support non-addictive opioid development? Uh, yes, you know, as, as with the previous question on whether or not we can, can consider CBD or, or opioids, we can, but we need, we will need data uh, to really support that there is very low abuse or addiction potential for those kinds of compounds. Okay, we, we, are, we are at time now, and we really appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, if you have any further questions, we will uh, try to post a post webinar fact page along with the webinar recording itself. And uh, we welcome questions submitted to us or calls via email. Uh, and you can use epicnet at nindsnih.gov or email any of the epicnet staff directly. Um, and the information can be found on our website. Um, so thank you again for your attention, and we look forward to hopefully seeing some assets and applications come in.